The Early Stage Anesthesia Scholars, or ESAS, serves the interest of early career anesthesiologist scientists, providing an academic home for developing scholars in anesthesiology. The objectives of ESAS are to foster peer and senior mentorship in both career and scientific topics, to support the needs and interests of young professionals interested in an academic career in anesthesiology, to enhance peer networking and collaborative opportunities, and to encourage the sharing of enthusiasm and ideas among its members, and to develop and implement strategies at an institutional, regional, national, or international level that support retention of anesthesiologist scientists in a research-oriented career track and reduce the attrition of motivated scholars at all career stages. Uh, today, we have planned a series of um, sessions where we will be hearing from uh, both senior um, members of our community as well as other young scholars um, about different uh, topics that uh, we thought would be important uh, for us to be talking about and discussing. Um, as a couple of housekeeping items as we get started. Uh, we will be using this same Zoom meeting throughout the entire day, so you can feel free to stay logged in throughout the entire session. And that includes at the end of the day, we will be having our business meeting um, after the final panel presentation. Um, no, we invite everyone to stay online for that business meeting. No prior involvement with ESAS prior to today is necessary for you to engage with us. Um, please mute yourself anytime that you are not speaking. Uh, we will have question and answer sessions at the end of each of the panel presentations. Um, so we would love to see faces and see your cameras uh, at that time. Um, but we do ask that you just are muted when you're not talking. And also you can use the chat function at any time to pose questions to the speakers. And then we do have some uh, breaks that are built in throughout our agenda uh, throughout the day. Uh, but of course, any time that you need to take a moment, um, feel free to take a break on your own. Uh, again, make sure that you are muted and camera off any time that you're, you're doing that. Um, and before we uh, get into the programming, I do want to just have a few thank yous that we wanted to make sure we acknowledge. Uh, first, uh, thank you to IARS, AUA, and SOPA for allowing us to be part of the annual meeting um, once again this year. We're really excited. And also thank you for the ongoing support from those organizations, as well as the support that we get from ASA and from FAIR. We're very grateful. Um, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the planning committee of ESAS members who put together the programming, uh, brainstorming the topics, um, uh, inviting and recruiting the speakers. Um, it's been a, re very, a real team effort to put this programming together, and we hope that you will uh, really enjoy the program that we've put together. Um, thank you to Kristen Howard and the rest of the um, annual meeting planning team for handling all of the myriad of logistics behind the scenes for planning the event and also converting it to a virtual format as well. Um, and thank you to our speakers who are taking time out of their busy schedules to, uh, to share their perspectives and to invest in the future of academic anesthesiology. And especially, um, with the change to the virtual format, we did have a change to a new date from when we were originally scheduled. So I wanna thank the speak some of our speakers were very flexible in uh, figuring out how to make, uh, make themselves available on this new date. And we also did have some speakers who uh, were willing to step in with relatively short notice and were really uh, to fill in the gaps in the schedule. So we're really, really grateful. And thank you to all of you uh, for joining us and, and giving up a Saturday. Um, we hope that you will find this to be a, um, an enjoyable and a, a fruitful meeting. Um, hope that we'll make some new connections and have some good discussion as we go forward. Uh, so with that, um, I'm going to hand things over to uh, Dr. Kimberly Rangel, uh, who is the other co-chair for today's program and also will be moderating our first panel. All right. Good morning and thank you so much to everyone for being here um, and for spending your Saturday with us. Uh, I really want to echo um, everything that Brad said. It's been a, an awesome team effort and we're very thankful to everyone who is participating and to all of our amazing speakers um, for taking the time out um, to be here with us. So I'm very excited 
um, to start start off with this first panel, um, expanding the uh, academic footprint of or footprint of academic anesthesiology, um, and we have uh, an awesome group of speakers who will be sharing some of their insight with you this morning. Um, so. First up, we have Dr. Vesna Todorovic, who's the inaugural CU Medicine Endowed Chair and Chair of the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Um, she completed her graduate education at the University of Belgrade in Serbia and the University of Illinois, Chicago, where she completed a PhD and went on to do residency training in anesthesia at Washington University in St. Louis. She also has an MBA from the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia and received the Harold Karen Professor of Anesthesiology Endowment from the University of Virginia Health System during her time on faculty there. She's currently a practicing anesthesiologist and um, also a clinician scientist for the past 25 years where she studies anesthetics as neurotoxins, management of chronic pain and mechanisms of anesthesia induced developmental neurodegeneration. Um, and she has uh, uh, extensive federal funding um, and over 100 peer reviewed publications and 11 patents and multiple other grants. She's also the chair of the National Institute of Health Surgery, Anesthesiology and Trauma Study section and serves on the editorial board for multiple journals. Um, and has been um, a member of the board of directors for the International Society for Anesthetic Pharmacology since 2007 and um, served as chairman in 2015. Um, she has mentored and trained multiple graduate students, medical students, postdocs, um, and as chair of the Department of Anesthesiology, focuses on mentorship and growth of junior faculty, expanding the clinical programs, and increasing collaboration with the School of Medicine and the surrounding community. Our second speaker will be Dr. Michael Mathis, who is a cardiac anesthesiology and the director of cardiothoracic anesthesia research at the University of Michigan. Um, his research is centered on improving perioperative care for patients with heart failure, uh, including management of left ventricular assist devices, heart failure medications, and interventions to improve outcomes during cardiac surgery. And he's also the associate research director for the multicenter perioperative outcomes group, known as MPOG, which is an international consortium of over 50 perioperative databases nationally. And through his directorship role, he oversees the development of research proposed by physician investigators at participating institutions um, and leads an effort to integrate the Society of Thoracic Surgeons Outcomes databases with the MPOG database. Um, so he has a huge interest in leveraging data science methods, including machine learning, natural language processing, and signal processing to improve the diagnosis and management of cardiovascular disease, um, as well as the, um, the way we provide perioperative care uh, by collaborating with really large groups of, of folks. And finally, um, we had somewhat of a last minute change to our program. And so we are very, very thankful to Dr. Janine Wiener Kronisch for allowing us um, to share the excellent, excellent talk that she provided last year for this um, and for possibly being here with us today. I haven't had a chance to check the entire um, participant list at the moment, um, but such an honor to have her participate again this year. Um, she's the distinguished Henry Isaiah Dorr Professor of Research and Teaching in Anesthetics and Anesthesia at the Harvard Medical School in Boston, um, and she served as an anesthetist in chief at Massachusetts General Hospital from 2008 to 2019. Um, she uh, did her early training at the University of California at Los Angeles, um, and then obtained her MD from the University of California at San Francisco. She has done residencies in internal medicine, um, a pulmonary clinical and research fellowship um, at UCSF, and then completed a residency in anesthesia. So she's board certified in internal medicine, pulmonary anesthesia, and critical care medicine. Um, and she has devoted much of her academic career to investigating mechanisms of acute lung injury by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, she has served as a senior editor for um, the journal Anesthesiology, as well as an associate editor for multiple textbooks. Um, and she is uh, obviously one of the most active members of our um, of our specialty and of our community um, and has a very, very extensive history of publishing and has uh, won numerous awards for her um, academic work. And uh, she has um, also received the Lifetime Award for Science from the American Thoracic Society and the Lifetime Achievement Award for Critical Care from SOCA. 
Um, so we are very, very um, happy to have all of these speakers with us today and excited to hear what they have to share with us. And so we'll, we will get started um, with the videos of their talks and then um, we'll transition into a period of question and answer. So I encourage you to drop all of your questions in the chat and I look forward to a very robust discussion with our speakers. Thanks, Dr. Rangel. Do you want me to start sharing my uh, slide presentation? Because I think I'm the first today. Um, yeah, if uh, that would be perfect. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Let me see, because I'm going to do it alive. I don't have it recorded, so I just wanted to. Yes, perfect. Please take it away. Yes. Can you see this presentation? We can. OK, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for a lovely introduction. And you know, I would like to take a moment to express gratitude. Oh, let me see, this is not in a presentation mode. Is it now in a presentation mode? Is it better? It is. Thank you. Just to express my gratitude for giving me the opportunity to present today to the, you know, gratitude to the organizers and in particular, my thanks to Dr. Burke who uh, was kind enough to reach out and have me present. I don't have any uh, financial conflicts. I'm not peddling any products. I'm not trying to get rich by giving this talk. So no conflicts of interest. So I was asked to talk about the role of women in academic anesthesiology. And I thought I should start by giving you a quick uh, stats on how the pipeline looks like. In other words, how many women versus men we have entering um, medical school in the United States, in Canada and UK, just for the sake of comparisons. You can see that we had we have hit the point when actually slightly more than 50% of women are present in the School of Medicine and finish uh, this graduate degree. And it's very similar in Canada and UK. So you can see that we are entering the special uh, entering the profession in large numbers. Unfortunately, this is where good news stops, and I'll show you some other data. Um, and that is all really mainly over the last ten years. And I kind of stopped as of 2019, looking at over 30 publications that came out. So we may be a couple of years during COVID, little out of date. Um, if you look at the number of women faculty in academic anesthesiology who are considered to be full-time faculty, this is when we seem to fall down uh, quite a bit compared to how many of us enter medical school. And if you look at the United States and Canada and UK, again, you can see that it's fairly comparable. And in actually, you, you uh, United States may look a little better, but you have about... 30 something percent of women with close to 70% of men colleagues who are full-time faculty in academic setting. Now, it gets slightly worse when you look at how many women end up in a leadership position and or promoted to full professor, which is uh, ultimate promotion in the academic departments. And here we can see that uh, the numbers go down even more. In the United States, we've had anywhere between 10 to 12% women uh, full professors for quite a long time, uh, actually maybe slightly more than that. But if you look at the US chairs, it's slightly above 10%. And UK looks slightly better than us, but not by much, about 14%. And the, the, the rest of the balance is our male colleagues. So. Uh, we go from having fewer, fewer of us in the full-time position in academia, and then even fewer of us being promoted to full professor or and becoming the chairs. So the question is, why is that the case? If you look at the uh, evidence that is available right now based on the surveys and current publications, these are the reasons that were cited by uh, folks who were interviewed. And some of them, it's really uh, kind of difficult to address immediately, but uh, some of them I will share with you because I think we may have uh, something we can do about it. Unsupported work environments, lack of mentorship, and a lot of that is kind of a self-propagating prophecy when you think about it because it's fewer of us 
full professors and then even fewer of us who are funded and therefore it's very difficult to find the mentors um, in, a, in a female uh, academic group. I have to tell you over the last 25 years, all of my mentors were men and they were very kind to me and very supportive, but all of them were men. Women make personal choices that we have to make because of many reasons. And we also have very high childcare responsibilities that does affect our decision-making. But the one that I would like to focus on today is what actually is pretty um, disturbing to read is active discrimination against women that was uh, actually cited in quite a few publications I uh, studied for this presentation. And it's considered to actually be the primary factor, 40% of folks who were interviewed cite that as being the reason why women do not take uh, leadership positions and do not get promoted uh, over the course of last 10 years, at least based on the data that I have. It is stated that women receive less credit when applying for funding or grants. So there is a statistic that shows that based on how many women apply and based on how many women actually get funded, there is a quite a bit of disproportional outcomes when compared to our male colleagues. There's also very uh, hard statistics here that's been actually around for a long time when I was at Wash U over 25 years ago, there was a presentation done by a very astute speaker who actually had the data showing exactly this fact. And I have to tell you, it hasn't changed, at least if you look at the past 10 years. We need to publish three additional papers in high impact journal or 20 additional papers in top journal in our specialty in order to earn the same application scores when we apply for a grant, and that is from the NIH database. Now, what are the leadership characteristics that are highly sought after in our male colleagues? This is what they call masculine behaviors. It's great to be competitive. It's even better to be ambition, ambitious, and definitely confidence does not hurt. If you look at those behaviors in women, they are perceived as being um, more hostile, less rational, and these are not the behaviors that we are encouraged to display. So I find that very interesting uh, discrepancy. Now you've heard about the compensation and AAMC is really cracking down on that and a lot of issues now with um, new act that's called equal work, equal pay for equal work that's been going around. But when the study was done, when over 6,700 folks were uh, reached out to and got the responses from, the authors reported that in average, women anesthesiologists in academia make 29% less than men anesthesiologists. Now, some adjusting had to be done for experience, for number of hours we work, because women do tend to work part-time more, type of compensation plan that uh, the programs have. For example, if they encourage calls, women often don't like to take as much call because they wanna be with the family. And then some of the employer characteristics, there's still 7% difference that was considered to be a significant gap when everything else is considered roughly equal. When it comes to recognition awards for women, this was very interesting. The database goes back to 1945. And as I said, my search ended in 2019. And out of 211 Distinguished Service Awards, only 25 were given to women. Again, we always hover around 10 to 12%. The highest proportion of women awardees, 40%, came from the Society for Ambulatory Anesthesia and the Society for Education in Anesthesia. So we do have something to learn from these two societies. In contrast, as of 2019, if you look at our largest society, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, the International Society for Anesthetic Pharmacology that I belong to, and the Society of Cardiovascular Anesthesiologists, there was not a single woman recipient in the past 10 years. Now you've heard different strategies and we talk about it and we've been talking about it ever since I've been in academia, which is over 25 years. 
what it is that we can do to make it better and different for our female colleagues who are just as motivated and just as willing to do what it takes. Well, often we suggest to develop programs for recruiting, promoting, and retaining women faculty members. And, you know, they should not be uh, that horribly different than what we would use for our uh, male counterparts, except for being a little more uh, willing to consider accommodations in terms of daycare, uh, uh, where the facility is, you know, nursing stations for, for nursing mothers, and so on and so forth. Um, but other than that, it's kind of hard to truly understand what that means. Um, perhaps the search committees should be very uh, in, in tuned with the recruitment of women, in particular in leadership positions. So the composition of the search committees is important because it does allow uh, a, a view, different views or a different approach to the recruitment or recognition for the leadership positions. Um, we also really need to actively consider the increased number of female recipients of the awards of excellence keynote speakers. When I was on SAT study section, uh, it was uh, literally less than 20% of us women represented on that study section. And um, there was an active effort and yet there was not as many of us our school at University of Colorado is unique. Our dean is very committed to recognizing uh, excellence among women. So we have 30% of our chairs are women, which as you know, is three times more than what you see nationally. Now, academic journals need to really take a pause and see how they could, and it is most likely uh, unconscious gender bias, but they need to track uh, and look at the publishing records regarding gender for the authors, reviewers, and editors. We just got a notification last week that for the first time, the editor of the anesthesiology is going to be a woman. So this is really excellent news, which is going to allow us to look at this particular component because it becomes a vicious cycle. When you can't publish, then you can't get funded, then you can't get published because you don't have money to fund your research. And then it's, uh, it leads to either leaving the academia or dropping out of any academic efforts. And then for the NIH and other funding agencies to re uh, redesign research funding allocations so that more emphasis is uh, placed on the content of the proposal rather than on the previous publications. Because if the emphasis is simply on the numbers, the women seem to get a short stick in this equation. Now, I wanted to finish with a couple of interesting quotes. This is from Theodore Roosevelt. And as you know, he was our president in early 20th century. So not that horribly long ago. When you look at this quote, you realize we did come a long way, you know, from where we were in early 20th century, early 90, 19, early 90s. He says, the best executive is the one who has sense enough to pick good men to do what he wants done and self-restrained to keep from mandling with them while they do, while they do it. It's a highly cited quote, and yet, there's not even a hint of an idea that a woman perhaps could be picked to do what she wants done and be left alone to do it well. I thought this was very interesting. Another one that I see with our faculty, there are two components being a chair now going on seven years. Women are very self-conscientious and they are always very concerned about potentially failing. I seldom see that uh, with our male colleagues. Um, they are poised, they don't have those thoughts. Um, so I thought that, that this quote would be interesting. And I share that with female faculty members when that comes up and I offer a leadership position and say, well, I've got so much on my plate. What if I don't do well? You know, this is a lot. Then I always say, well, you will fail, but the question you should ask is after I fail, what then, right? Is this going to define me or is this going to give me the experience that I need to do better next time with the support of folks you trust and folks around you? And certainly you will be more respected by all of those that are afraid to even try. 
And, you know, for all women in the audience, I would say, reach out, um, do your absolute best to be present, to be out there. It is okay if it doesn't turn out the best. You learn from that and you move on, um, be involved. And, you know, what I find sometimes as a chair, when I reach out to some of my female faculty, they would refuse to take on a leadership position that is being offered. I have never had a single male faculty of mine refusing to take on a leadership position when I offered it. So it's something to think about. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today. Of course, as any woman, I have to showcase my family that makes everything meaningful because just remember, without having a supportive family and supportive spouse, partner, a colleague, it is hard to do it alone. Thank you so much for your attention. We need to stop sharing, right? How do you want? I don't know how. If you click share screen. Okay, perfect. Stop. I see it now. It was hidden. Thank you so much. Sorry, it took a minute to figure it out. My apologies. Thank you so much for that excellent talk. Um, and I believe we will continue on with the recordings and then we'll um, please uh, drop any questions in the chat and then we'll address them all uh, at the end. Hello everybody, my name is Mike Mathis. I'm a cardiac anesthesiologist at the University of Michigan, research director for the Multicentering Perioperative Outcomes Group or MPOG for short. I welcome everybody, everybody to this Scholars Day virtual conference. And today I'll be within our panel discussing expanding the academic footprint of anesthesiologists. I'll be giving a talk on collaborations with clinicians and informaticians, the MPOG perspective. I have grant funding through the NIH and Department of Defense. I have no personal financial conflicts of interest with this talk. So the goals of this talk are twofold. Number one, to describe how anesthesiologists' public health impact can be enhanced through collaborations outside our department, and specific to this talk, collaborations with informaticians. And then wearing my early stage anesthesia scholars hat, um, being an advocate for, for ESOS and the Scholars Day, I'll frame this in the context of developing an academic career. Where I can start is with what I feel lucky to do today. First and foremost, I feel lucky to be a husband and a father to a loving family. Second, I feel lucky to be the research director of the Multicenter Perioperative Outcomes Group. I also feel lucky to have gained training and expertise in data science techniques, waveform processing, and machine learning, applied to perioperative care of very sick patients with advanced cardiovascular disease. And lastly, I feel lucky to be a cardiac anesthesiologist routinely taking care of some of the sickest, most complex patients in the hospital. But beyond just having some good luck, these opportunities came from having great career supporters. And for our scholars, I'd like to break down this slide, the different kinds of supporters you'll need to shape and sustain a successful, productive academic career. First, this starts out with mentors. And these are the folks that see the big picture and generally help map out your career, which can be overlapping with, but often different from sponsors who are generally in positions of power and can advocate for you and enable your success. They can get you on that conference panel or that study section or, or get you that visiting professor talk or link you up with that other faculty across campus or, or another institution who really can accelerate the impact of your work. You can contrast that with coaches who will get their hands dirty with you and they'll be in the trenches helping you perfect something very specific. That could be a specific research methodology could be a clinical competency or a softer science like public speaking. Finally, there's role models or folks that have traits that you admire and wish to emulate. And occasionally you're lucky enough to even meet these folks. It's helpful to see that person and know they exist to realize that that future is indeed attainable. For scholars listening in, I'd encourage you to take a few minutes right now to reflect on who these uh, people, these different sponsors might be in your life. 
and consider having an explicit conversation with at least the mentors, sponsors, and coaches about their potential value in your own career development. Just a few more words on role models. I want to take one minute to highlight a national initiative in our field, the RADAR Initiative, which stands for Raising Anesthesiology Diversity and Anti-Racism, which really seeks to challenge what success and role models representing those success those successes should look like. I invite you to visit the website via the QR code here and join the discussion. But with the time I have on this panel, I'll paraphrase the words of Dr. Megan Lane Fall, an incredibly talented anesthesiologist, clinician, scientist who, in regards to the radar initiative, points out that we can better see where we can go if we weren't so constrained by historical notions of what people are supposed to do. Going back to the things that I feel lucky to do today, what I've been asked to speak about today is how anesthesiologists can collaborate with informatics experts to build an ac academic career doing both research and quality improvement. And so to do this, I'll start with a conceptual framework for how research and QI fit into clinical care through the lens of the learning health system, which is traditionally thought of as an academic medical center, but can really be any medical center. And the concept of a learning health system is to marry the processes of research and quality improvement into a cycle. And on the left-hand side of this figure, starting at the bottom, you can start with a hypothesis, which can be tested through the collection and analysis of data, in this case, electronic health data, and publication of that knowledge gleaned from that data. That process, taking data and transforming it into knowledge is better known as research. On the right-hand side of this figure, which is often the hard part, is, is taking that knowledge and determining how to update best practices based on this new knowledge, engaging providers and implementing evolving best practices. And that's better known as quality improvement. One example of a learning health system applied to our specialty is the multi-centered perioperative outcomes group. Basically a group of clinicians at over 50 hospitals across the US, uh, working with informaticians, quality improvement champions, united by a shared goal of using anesthesiology data to improve care. Here's a QR code for the MPOG website, which I invite you to explore on your own time. But with my time here today, I'd love to just give you a snapshot of what uh, MPOG the, the, as a learning health system can do to improve care. What does this look like in real time? Well, we can start with a practicing clinician caring for patients and generating electronic health data. We can take that data, we can clean it, we can analyze it, and we can test hypotheses that might lead to a research publication. These publications informing best practices can then be discussed at regional collaborative quality meetings. Here's an example of a collaborative quality meeting in Michigan, bringing together surgeons and anesthesiologists across the state of Michigan to discuss improving care for patients undergoing surgery. These quality measures can be designed and refined and displayed back to clinicians caring for patients, locally implemented by a team of institution-specific anesthesia quality champions, and then finally circling back to the clinician working to take care of the patient at the point of care. How can we collaborate with informaticians to improve this learning health system? Well, with the explosion of EHR data, we all know very well that more data isn't always better if there isn't a way to digest it and to do so in a way that engages clinicians on the front line in a way that they define as useful. And so to dig into the way that ways that informaticians can help address these challenges, I can offer two specific examples of collaborations with informaticians that advanced my own work. In, in one specific example lesson I've learned in early stages of my career is that data quality beats data quantity every time. And I'll work through a very specific, deep example of this with you right now. I had a research project where I wanted to look at a patient's baseline blood pressure to help understand relative hypotension defined as a decrease from your, your baseline blood pressure. We wanted to look at that impact of relative hypotension on the risk of acute kidney injury after major non-cardiac surgery. In this figure, this was a visualization that an informatician came up with to help me understand the data that we could use to do this research project. In this figure, each color cluster is a different hospital within MPOB. Each dot is a specific case. And within that case, 
is a specific baseline blood pressure defined as the first blood pressure that was observed when the patient got to the operating room. In some cases, the data made sense, but in other cases, we had institutions submitting data that just didn't seem to make a lot of sense. So in this case, again, we have on the x-axis cases over time. So we have data from 2009 to 2012. And we have a cluster of patients whose baseline mean arterial pressure was around 80. And that seemed to make sense. We have this other cluster of patients with a baseline blood pressure of 250. And clearly, these aren't all patients with malignant hypertension or pheochromocytomas. There's probably some issue underlying the quality of the data uh, that we could only really unpack when we saw this visualization. How did we then explore this problem with um, potential problem with data quality? We created another tool, the case by case review tool, which allows you to create a sample of cases. So we had this um, variable, your, your baseline in the OR blood pressure. We wanted to get a random sample of 10 cases at this institution that had that each had a baseline blood pressure above 125. And when we dug into the intraoperative records for each of these 10 sample cases where their baseline blood pressure was really high, we found that the issue was just a clamped A-line. So these patients were brought into the room. An A-line was connected, but not transducing the patient's arterial blood pressure. It was just clamped, but it was recording into the electronic health record. And we got this blood pressure that was spuriously high. And if we had taken, if we hadn't uncovered that, we could have come to some misguided conclusion about relative hypotension in the OR. We could have incentivized misguided practices because we didn't realize we had this problem with their data. And so this concept of taking messy, raw electronic health data and cleaning out artifacts, triangling, triangulating some useful clinical inference, it's called digital phenotyping. It's not something that we've uniquely come up with. It's a process that all specialties in healthcare are trying to apply to electronic health data to help better do research and quality improvement. And here I just show a, a range of different kinds of data that gets into the electronic health record. You have administrative data, ICD-9, ICD-10 codes, medications, laboratory values, patient demographics, physiologic data like the blood pressures that we were showing on the previous slide, um, procedure codes. All of these things we can use to combine into a phenotype, we can uh, combine all of these different ranges of data sources, apply them to a logic circuit that gives you a higher confidence, higher order clinical inference that we can call a digital phenotype. Now, broadly speaking, a phenotype is a composite representation of individual observable traits. When you apply it to the electronic health record, we're talking about a composite representation of patient characteristics or clinical events that are manifested in the EHR. Again, these are high-level clinically useful inferences drawn from logical application of multiple raw health data inputs. And when you create these phenotypes, like baseline blood pressure, where we can screen out clamped A-lines or other blood pressure artifact, or maybe we, we want to create a phenotype for general anesthesia, right? This can be a patient that has an advanced airway in place or a patient that we've noted to be exhaling volatile anesthetic or a patient that we gave a neuromuscular blocker. Those are three ways in the EHR that you can detect general anesthesia. And if we take those um, triangulations of raw data, we have much more useful Lego building blocks for research and quality improvement projects. And we don't want to reinvent the wheel. If we, the next project that we want to do that uses baseline blood pressure, we now have the painstaking effort that we went through to create this phenotype, we can just reuse it, reuse this Lego building block and do great research and quality improvement without having to reinvent the wheel. Um, so that's a principle that we've really taken to heart within MPOG and we found has been a valuable contribution uh, by informaticians helping clinicians uh, advance care. This notion of phenotyping, again, it's not unique to anesthesia. There's a whole database of different kinds of phenotypes um, at available at uh, the phenotype knowledge base or pkb.org. Here's the QR code. But again, this is a collaborative environment for building and validating electronic algorithms to better identify cohorts of patients within health data for both research and quality improvement.
Getting on to the second lesson that I've learned in collaborating with informaticians to advance research and quality improvement in anesthesia. I'll take a quote from Bill Gates, and that is, a bad strategy will fail no matter how good your information is, and the lame execution will stymie a good strategy. And if you do enough, and if you do enough things poorly, you'll go out of business. So this idea that ideas that don't engage frontline clinicians are doomed to failure if we don't think through that process. And in informatics, there's a saying that informatics is 10% medicine, 10% technology, but really just 80% getting folks on the same page about what our best practice is and what can we do to come together to change our practices, to embrace a new best standard and improve care for patients. So we can look at this through the lens of, of a researcher or a quality improvement expert. And I'll, I'll do the research uh, lens first. So how do we make big data available to do research um, for, uh, for clinicians who aren't necessarily computer programmers or part of the friends and family plan that are connected to the medical information officers at their hospital? Well, we've created this tool called Data Direct. The idea is to democratize access to these clinicians who again aren't computer programmers or aren't part of the friends and family plan and we've created this intuitive pick list interface for creating research queries at your local hospital or across mpog and on the left hand side you can see different categories of electronic health data and you can on the right hand side of the screen filter down to a cohort that you might be interested in doing a research or quality improvement uh, project on and so in this example slide, I hypothetically show that we can figure out a cohort of, of how many adults in MPOG with renal failure underwent general anesthesia and received Sigamidex. And we can rapidly get down to that case count and understand whether that research or quality improvement effort is feasible to do within MPOG and can, can that be then taken to a research meeting or a quality improvement meeting to either do a new study, a new observational research study, or develop a new quality improvement measure. When we when you get that output of that data, again, it's intuitive. It's an Excel spreadsheet, and, and that's one way you can get it. And um, that's something that a clinician can handle. So looking at it through the the lens of a quality improvement champion now. So so how can we make um, quality improvement efforts? accessible? How, how can informaticians help make these QI efforts accessible to clinicians? And the answer to that has been to create a QI dashboard, quality improvement dashboard, curated by a quality champion at the site, selecting measures relevant to their practice and displaying those measures to clinicians in an easy to digest format. So this was an interface, a dashboard that was created by clinicians within MPOG to help anesthesiologists understand the care that they're delivering to their patients. And this is just a, an example dashboard of an anesthesiologist who over the past year did 250 cases and different, we show different quality measures. So how often did these patients have severe hypotension? How often were high glucose is treated or low glucose is treated? How often was lung protective ventilation used? How often did this clinician's patients receive appropriate anti-emetics uh, to prevent or mitigate PONV. So these are all, again, quality improvement measures derived from logic from the electronic health record and displayed in an intuitive, useful way to clinicians uh, for quality improvement. So with my short time today, I thank you. Take home points. Number one, collaboration opportunities require career supporters, they require the mentors, the sponsors, coaches, and role models to be able to advance career advancement. And I, I want you to think carefully today about who those folks might be in your life. Number two, perioperative data is messy and abundant, but informaticians can show us how to use it for good. And three, we have to follow through. Impact comes from collaboration and commitment. Not everything is measurable, or not everything that's measurable matters. Not everything that matters is measurable. It's up to clinicians to decide what's important, focus on that, and commit to improving best practices. Here's our informatics team and our clinicians team at University of Michigan. Thank you, everybody, for your time.
Thank you so much, Dr. Mathis. And I believe that we have one more recording to share um, and then we will dive into some questions. And I see a couple popping up in the chat, so keep adding them. So I have no financial disclosures. Um, I did want to say that my learning objective today is to acknowledge that we all work very hard to be incredibly competent, skillful, knowledgeable physicians and scientists. But I think my career shows that opportunity is a key factor in success. And this is what we're going to be talking about today, opportunity, how mentors help you with opportunity, how sponsors help you with opportunity. And in fact, success really depends on opportunity. So I do want to talk a little bit about myself. I have to say I really enjoyed the previous talks. Um, I could recognize a lot of features in my own career. This is a caricature of what I looked like when I started med school. I was 20. My parents made it very clear that they expected academic success, and they made sure I knew nothing else except school. Um, so I entered medical school totally, you know, unworldly. I was totally naive. Uh, it led me to a career in internal medicine because I liked a couple of the professors in internal medicine, and I loved being an intensivist. I loved being in the intensive care. And the people who ran the intensive care unit of my first rotation were pulmonologists. So I became a pulmonologist. That was the thought process. And to be a pulmonologist, I did four years of clinical work, and then I joined a laboratory. So in internal medicine, research is obligatory and is if you specialize. So I spent four years in a lab, and then I said to my husband, well, maybe I should get a PhD. And he said, maybe you should get a job. Um, so I went to the chief of medicine who said to me, well, women really don't have a place in academic medicine. And the division chief agreed with that assessment. There were no women in pulmonary medicine. I was the second woman pulmonary fellow. So what was I to do? My husband had a great job in San Francisco. So the people in the lab were very helpful. This is an abridged version of people who have helped me throughout my career, which now, uh, luckily for me, I'm still here. It's more than 40 years that I've been in. In fact, I just celebrated my 45th medical school alumni uh, celebration. Um, so the lab, I worked with Dr. Stab and Dr. Mathay, and Dr. Mathay had a job in the ICU at the University Hospital in Chenin. Why don't you retrain as an anesthesiologist? They'll give you a job. And so I talked to Dr. Miller, Ronald Miller, who said not only would he give me a job, he would make sure I succeeded in academic medicine. So if I have to make one point, it's that don't be foolish like me and not have a career plan, but also go with people who want to support you. Um, and that was the wisest decision I've made in my career, was to retrain as an anesthesiologist. So early on, I had researchers that were helping me make my career judgments. And then later on, I needed other kind of mentors to make it as a chair. And so who you have as a mentor is going to be depending on where you are in your career, what, what time point you are in your career, and you will need other mentors for other career decisions, just as you've heard previously. Um, Talmadge King is a pulmonologist who helped me get uh, positions at the American Thoracic Society and be recognized still as a pulmonologist even when I became an anesthesiologist. And then I had women mentors only after I became an anesthesiologist. Uh, Usha Raj, I should say, did help me. We were more of the same period colleagues, but I had women chair come help me when I wanted to be chair. I wanted to be a researcher. Uh, I loved being a researcher. And so I ran a lab for more than 30 years. Now I will say running a lab 
teaches you some administrative skills. It's a very different administrative skill than becoming a chair. And we could talk about that if there's time. But I had two basic scientists who I worked a lot with and collaborated with, Dara Frank and Susan Lynch, who helped me create a wonderful lab that dealt with basic science as well as translational research. I had medical students who stayed with me and I had lots of people from other countries and other places come visit and work with me. Teji Sawa spent 10 years with me. Uh, he was fundamental to some of the success of our projects. He is now chair in Kyoto. Benoit Massé is a chair in France. Michael Gropper actually was part of my first lab. He was getting his PhD, and then we collaborated when I became an anesthesiologist. And he, of course, is chair at UCSF. So running a lab is a great experience. The two things I would say about it are it's flexible time. It doesn't mean you don't work. You work a lot, but you work on your own schedule. So I think for women and young men, having a family is doable when you're running, having a research career. Whereas clinical careers are pretty uh, stringent about the time you have to be in the OR, in the ICU. I found running a lab actually more flexible and gave me the ability to have two careers, being a clinician as well as being a researcher. I also think for people who have physical problems, disabilities, being a researcher is part of, it gives you another flexible way of having a career. I want to go through what's the difference between sponsorship and mentorship. So sponsorship, it's what Talmadge King did for me. He put me up for committees at the ATS. He gave me talks. This is really important for your budding career. Editorials and manuscripts, so knowing people on the editorial board. I saw Jerry Levy was uh, participating in this meeting. He's an incredible friend and resource for young people because he's an editor at Anesthesiology. Becoming members of committees and important organizations can help your career. And having someone sponsor you to be a committee member is very important and nominating you for award. And I will see Michael Mathay nominated me and I got a lifetime achievement from the American Thoracic Society in part because of him, I'm sure. Mentors help you with your research. So they also help can help you with other aspects of your career. They can help you make career decisions. Again, Michael Mathay was imperative in leading me to anesthesia, even though it was out of his own department and getting offered to opportunities that are not always easy to find. So I would say my career shows uh, issues of a lack of planning, not knowing anything about academic medicine, and luckily getting mentorship and sponsorship at a time that was critical in my career that made all the difference for my success. So Dr. Schreiber uh, went to a talk at the Brigham and this woman had some really practical ideas. Uh, this is Dr. Seeley at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. So let's talk about some practical considerations so that you can think about what you want for sponsors and mentors. So I'd say all of us understand the one-to-one, -one, but I just pointed out that, you know, at different time points in your career, you're going to need different mentors. And you might need more than just one to one. Okay. Peer mentoring, very important. I had lots of people who were also doing research who, those two women I showed you, I would consider that peer mentoring, where we really worked together on projects and collaborated and helped each other. Reverse mentoring, I've had this very successfully. In part, you're seeing slides that were created because one of my residents said, you know, I really like your talks, but your slides, no good. So you have to be able to accept criticism from everyone. And I was very grateful that he took the time to, you know, come up to me and offer really, you know, honest feedback. Developmental monitoring, this is what we've been talking about, that you need networks, you need different people at different times with different expertise. 
because your career changes. I like to think I've had several careers actually, uh, both in research, being a chair, and now trying to be almost a full-time mentor. You can actually, I was very interested in what Dr. Hellman showed, that you can write down things and sort of keep track of your mentors. So getting the job done, who's helping you get your work requirements fulfilled? Is it close, modern, or distant? Advancing your career, and then getting personal support. And I want to emphasize this, it's very important to make sure that you are doing well in your career because life has issues and problems can get in the way. And so we can talk about that. How do you get personal support? I'm a big fan of exercise. I'm also a big fan of really finding a great person for a relationship. I think that really helps. Um, full, full disclosure, my parents actually moved up when I had a child and I'm forever grateful for their help, so much so that I told my children I would move to help them. So far, they haven't taken me up on that. You can map out your network and you'll see that there are junior people and there are junior people. I am very grateful again to residents and to fellows who've been offering their critique of things I'm doing and ways I do things. And then of course there are senior mentors and there are peers. So the thought that you need some older person to tell you, you know, what's happening is distinctly not true. So it does take a village and she actually, Dr. Seeley has several publications Again, we, I want to emphasize at different times in your life, you will need different career advice and different sponsors and different mentors. And having a developmental network is very important. So you want, perhaps the best thing to say is you want people with disparate ideas. Um, you want to have an open mind and listen to critiques and see what's going on with your career and how you can make it better. So one of the most important things is to be open, open to ideas and open to critiques, because we all know there are going to be setbacks. We all know there are failures. You get a grant that isn't accepted. You have to rewrite it and you have to do it better. And I will say that for many years, I had no women mentors. Um, I think Diversity is really, really important. It's been shown to improve research. It's been shown to improve uh, academics. So I think this has got to be part of what we do in our organizations and what we do in our academic centers. We need the input from everybody to make our research, our education, our clinical prowess at the highest level. Redundancy, you need some redundancy, not a lot. Interconnectivity, I will tell you the relationships I made throughout my research career, I still have. I This Friday, I'll be judging grants from Belgium because of relationships I made during my years in research. Um, you get to see the world if we ever open up again for travel and go visit people who are doing research. So research is a great career. Academics is a great career um, for longevity, for interconnectivity, and strength of connection, because you can help each other. And that's phenomenal for humanity. Powers and influence. Um, I would ask Tony about that. Um, my connections to power and influence are slim, but uh, I did do um, some rotations at the NIH. I know Dr. Hellman did as well. It helps to learn what grants they're looking for. It teaches you skills if that's your interest in how to get grants. Finally, you can evaluate how you're doing with this kind of schema. And I would say, again, the concept of who should be your mentor should be open 
different ages, different genders, different races. And I will say I straddled several departments. Um, contact frequency, I had, when I became a chair, I had several chairs call me every week to offer their help. Um, I thought that was amazing. I th it was enormously helpful. The length of the relationship, I've had several of these relationships now for going on 40 years. So I think that when you look back at your career, you can say, this was really good. I have no regrets. I have to say that uh, I still love going to work. I still see it as a big part of my life. My husband and I still haven't uh, retired. We just can't seem to do that. And uh, I think that's a sign of a successful career and successful mentoring. And with that, I do want to say there are some issues and we recognize that. And that's why we have to have more diverse uh, faculty, more diverse residents, insufficient senior mentors of the same identity. It's true. Uh, men were equally helpful as the women in my case. Mentoring across differences is important, and I'd say peers and even people who are perhaps a little uh, younger in their careers. So these are my opinions. I do recognize you need a balanced life. I have two children, one grandchild, um, and I am very devoted to my family, and I am very grateful that they've allowed me to have this career. I think you want to feel that your residents, fellows, and faculty think of you as supportive and helpful. And you want to enjoy life. One thing is an intensivist that I recognize, health is arbitrary. Uh, you have to be grateful for what you have. And it's a really good goal to be at work thinking you're going to improve patient care and outcomes. And that was the goal and is my goal in my career. <clears throat> well, thank you so much to all of our speakers for sharing such wonderful insight. And um, let me just say again that it's such an honor to have um, so many people who are have really such illustrious careers and, and have done so much um, for the field and accomplished so much to be here to spend time um, to spend time with us and to offer their insights. Um, so I'm just going to dive right in. Um, with a couple of questions from the chat. Um, and uh, please continue to add them. And I will say, um, I've noticed um, we have, of course, Dr. Mathis and Dr. Todorovic, and it looks like Dr. Wiener Kronish has joined us as well. So thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to start with the first question um, in the chat um, to Dr. Todorovic. Thank you so much for a really enlightening talk. Um, and the question was, what can he for she mentors do to really help break the cycle of gender bias in healthcare leadership? Yeah, I saw that question actually, Michael, that's a very good question. As I said, and Janine also alluded to that, I had really a lot of male mentors and they all been very kind to me. And what they did to me, for me is exactly what the Janine said. They provided the opportunities for me. They got me connected. Uh, they had me speak. They recommended me for an award or a membership. Um, they wanted me to get involved at the national level. And my name came up once or twice. And then finally, they start recognizing your name. So what the mentors can really do or sponsors, I, I consider them kind of a, one, the extension of another is really to get your name out there and to consider you seriously for um, what um, is considered to be important, right? Um, and, and if we don't have that opportunity, then it becomes really this kind of a vicious cycle of not really being out there, not creating the relationships and networks and then kind of feeling left out. So if that makes sense, um, that's what I would say. And another thing, 
you know, when we listen to these talks, what is really amazing to me is that nothing substantial has changed over the last 25 years. And I don't know how we can break that cycle. Why is it still that all these years we only have 15% of us full professors? Why is it after all these years, we have only 10, 12% of us being the chairs? And all it stays, it, it shouldn't be just me being able to do it or you know any of the women in a leadership position. It should somehow be available to all the women who are in academic anesthesiology. So um, the best I can say is take every opportunity that comes your way. Do not decline any of these opportunities, just keep on going. And as Janine said, just rely on your family, rely on your friends, rely on your partners uh, to help you out and mentors. I don't know, Michael, whether that addresses some of the questions that's, or the question. That's great. I really appreciate that. I think w one thing I, I, you know, I think I think there's you know a lot of dimensions to this issue, and um, and I've been trying to think through it. You know, again, you know, I'm, I may be somebody that has the, the most to learn about this as, as a white male um, uh, with a physician uh, family, um, and uh, and so I've just I've just kind of tried to think through that. And um, although I'm not super far along in my career, I am a faculty that has mentees that are uh, residents, some faculty mentees as well. And I try to think through like, what is there, is there a specific stage that you think is, is where this drop off happens the worst, or is it just at all levels that, you know, the pipeline just keeps um, disadvantaging um, females? Um, is there, is there a, you know, a, a, a phase to, to focus on? Is it, um, or is it, uh, I think it's just kind of transcends any, any level um, going on to the next level, there's there's a certain amount of drop off in female leadership opportunities. Yeah, I don't know, Janine, whether you want to um, try to address this question. When I looked at the stats, just as you said, Michael, at every stage there is a drop off. Assistant professor goes to associate, there is a drop off. There goes to professor, there is a drop off, and then we fall from the face of the earth when it comes to major keynote speakers or major awards or chair womanships, or I don't even know what is the stats for the deansmanship, but I wouldn't be surprised that it's less than 5%. So I don't really, if you look at every stage, we kind of drop off. Janine, do you think that there is a stage when it happens more so than, I think Janine is with us, I'm not sure. Janine, can you hear us? I think I see you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, no, it's okay. Yeah. I am here. <laughs> uh, full disclosure, I was exercising, so I'm true to what I said. Um, I think what COVID showed us is that women have no support for childcare. This was a dreadful time for women. Um, it's true for men too. So someone has to take care of the family, and it usually ends up being the females. And when I speak to young women in our department, that's what they say. It's really, really hard to take care of young children and to be looking at your career. So what's different in other countries is there's child support. Italy, France, most of Europe, it doesn't exist here. It exists, my daughter lives in Australia, they have child support. So that's really a problem. It's a systemic problem. So I would say that's why it, affects women's careers. You, women have children and they need help with childcare. But you know, what's also interesting when you read the publications over the last 10 years, it's also seemingly the requirements are higher. I don't know how to explain that. Why does it take in average 25 more publications for a woman to be considered for the NIH funding? What are we missing there, right? And I cannot um, quite wrap my head around that. Well, we are actually just submitted a paper. Megan Lane Fall is the first author. And if you look at the chairs, which is what we did, a survey, there's actually pretty equivalent uh, careers in four different categories of women who are chairs. Research, you're the equivalent of the men in research. <laughs> um, I'd say for professorship, it may be different, but if you look at 
careers leading to chairs, they're very similar. The women match the men and vice versa. Um, so how to help women do it when they may have an extra burden, I guess is what I keep coming back to. Yeah. Can, can I just uh, add one thing in that I think is an interesting part of this conversation. I was following this thread on Twitter. Um, it's kind of come up a few times. What's interesting about this whole thing is um, not that there's not a issue across medical specialties, but for some reason, the surgeons have started to figure out how to recruit more females in, and we are lagging. And I don't quite understand that because typically you would think that surgeons, like surgery would be considered um, a harder lifestyle, if you would, but somehow they are recruiting more female physicians in, and anesthesiologists, it's, it's a drastic difference between men and women going into the specialty. So this problem is only going to get propagated. Um, so, I mean, there's so many layers of complexity. It's not just a pipeline issue, but it's only going to get worse potentially if we're not finding a way as a specialty to recruit more women in. And I don't know if people have thoughts as to why, um, why surgeons are doing better than we are on this whole thing. I, I don't quite get it. Um, the only thing I thought is, you know, I mean, as anesthesiologists, and this is more going at societal things, as anesthesiologists, we have to deal with uh, surgeons, you know, feeling like they're like the boss and stuff. And it's like for women, you face so many barriers at every level. So why is an anesthesiologist, would you want to go into a field where, again, you're considered, you know, that you take orders from someone or something like that? I don't know if that's a reason or what, but it doesn't make sense to me why we're not recruiting more females into the specialty. I would like to make a quick comment here uh, because I'm from Switzerland originally. Uh, you know, there is a big, as Jeanine said, there is a big difference between Europe and the US. Uh, in, for example, in Germany, uh, you, you can work part time in an academic center. By law, you can do it. And one of my editors for ANA is Dr. Zarbok, the chair in Münster, and he said to me many times, most of the, the female work in my department work part-time, but there are still some are still successful. The fact that you work part-time doesn't prevent you to move on with your career. And actually, if you look at who is professor in his department, there are several females. So I think the big problem we have in the US is that it's very difficult to work part-time. And as Jeanine nicely said, when you have children, someone has to take care of them. Well, it can be the man, it can be the woman, but generally it is the woman. And that needs to change at the level of the, the academic center, not the, the department level. I you agree, know, but shouldn't that, shouldn't that affect surgeons the same way? That's what I can't quite figure out. That, shouldn't that affect surgeons just as much? But uh, I'll let Dr. Dorovic speak. Oh no, sorry, sorry, no. Jamie, that's a very good question. It's actually very probing. Um, there are certain things where we cannot be helped. I'll give you an example. With my third pregnancy, I spent four months in bed, laying flat on my back. Now, for somebody like me, this is equivalent to suicide, right? When you feel good and there's nothing the matter with you and you have this enormous um, responsibility to actually extend your pregnancy as long as you possibly can, because you know this is the right place for your baby, right? And I became a specialist in embryology. I studied every week what it is that my daughter can do now. So if I were to deliver, could she do that? And could she do this? And you know, of course, lung maturation and being able to, to breastfeed was important. But there's nobody who could help me with that truly. I had a very supportive chair who was right there for me, but I couldn't go to the lab. I couldn't do the experiments. I could write and read, but that was about it. So there's, but Jamie, that doesn't answer your question. What about female surgeon, right? They have the same issue if they are laying flat in bed. I have two faculty members right now who are walking around and I didn't know there is such thing now. It's pretty amazing actually with those mobile pumps. So they pump as they are walking around. You can hear the sound and the bag filling up with milk as they are doing the cases or running the schedule. So women did find a way to do it, but it took me a while to wrap my head around it. 
Um, I believe um, Dr. Vavilala has a hand up and has also had a question in the chat, but I, I'll let you um, expand on it if you would like. Sure, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for a lovely uh, presentation and session. Um, going back to Dr. Todorovich's question around, or comments around a study section, my question um, is, you know, I wonder if organizations, um, anesthesiology organizations, some at least should consider it part of what they do to identify future study section members and uh, evaluate that. Because right now it's kind of ad hoc as to who gets invited to serve on study sections like SAT and others. And so I'm just curious as to what um, Janine and Vesna think about whether that should be something a part of what some particular organizations do. Janine, do you want to take off? Well, I was going to let you go first, Miss. <laughs> Monica, that's a very good question. And you're exactly right. It really depends on this SRO who he or she wants to uh, reach out to and invite. Um, it's a hard question. You know, the question is, should be, there be some kind of a effort by AAMC reaching out to the NIH? Should they be instructed in any particular way? You know, this is the ratio we expect you to strive for. I'm not sure, but I have to tell you personally, what irked me over the, you know, occasionally over the last 25 years was when I was, when it was almost insinuated that they want to check the box and you are there because you're a woman. Don't ever do that. That is very painful. That is very painful because all of us believe in what we do, and we really strive for the best. And when the reason for being chosen is indicated to be your being a woman, that hurts, that hurts. And we should never allow that to happen. So when I say, you know, you go to SRO and you say, I want 50-50, Monica and I were on the study section together. And I don't know, Monica, did we have 20% maybe at any point in time? I'm not sure now it's maybe yeah, I, better. I think so. And I would say, you know, watching you chair SAT was very instructional for me. Um, <laughs> you laugh, but, you know, so when I, when, when I think they, you know, they, they try to alternate chairs, you know, or alternate specialties. And um, so when I chaired SAT, it was, I actually reflected back on what I learned from, from watching you navigate some of the conversations and the styles of conversations that occurred during, uh, during your tenure as chair at SAT. So I think there probably should be some intentionality to making sure that it's not that just because you're a woman, although the, I will share that I was recruited to serve on study sections at NIH for what they perceived my phenotype was. And, 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 you know, I didn't, you're right. I didn't like it very much um, because it took away from what the content I brought to the, to the discussion. However, it was the only in I had. It wouldn't have happened otherwise. So the reality is that sometimes it's nice to talk about, you know, the theoretical frameworks for how things work, but should work. But sometimes you take opportunities, even if it's for the wrong reason. I just wanted to share that. I do agree with Monica. And I found myself, you know, on occasions, it, it hurts, but you get over it. As Janine, you were going to. Yeah, so I would say I agree with Monica that it should be more intentional. Um, I, I've taken a much more proactive stance in uh, the years since I've been chair. Uh, we are meeting tomorrow uh, from the AUA to set up mentoring, and I think this should be one subject. I think you learn a lot by being in the NIH. I was in the study section for I forget, seven years. I was on a data monitoring board for 12 years. <laughs> you learn how it works. And if you want to do research, that's really helpful. That's really helpful. And you meet a lot of people who can really help you in your career. So yeah, I think being intentional is OK. I think it's very helpful if you want to do research. And I think that would be part of the message I have at the AUA, that we need to discuss that open it up, make sure people are aware of opportunities. Thank you, Janine, yeah, that's good. 
Um, we have a lot more comments and questions coming up in the chat. Um, one that has come up both on Doc Matters and in the chat is sort of thinking about areas where women and men too leave academic medicine. Um, to um, Dr. Tavor Todorovic and Dr. Winter Kernish, is there any point looking back where you had considered leaving academic medicine and what sort of got you through? Um, and, or do you have any um, insight as your roles um, as chair as to why people leave academic medicine mid-career or what are some of those things that make them change course? Janine, do you want me to go first or would you like to address? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kim. Uh, in my case, the only time I truly thought that I should reconsider was when I finished my residency and wanted to do a robust research fellowship in another department. It was not a department of anesthesiology. And this is when I got a horrendous pushback, a horrendous pushback. And actually the only way I could do it once I decided I was gonna stick to it was to take a pretty substantial pay cut, work in the operating room a couple of days a week and be paid for that and work in the lab for free. And I did that for three years. That was the only time, and going back to what Janine said, and my younger son was uh, very young. He was three, four years old and I would drop him off in daycare. I would go to the lab and do it for free and repeatedly for three years until I got my K. I got a KOA, that's how I started. Well, I got FAIR first and then KOA. That was the only time when I seriously thought that this may not be the right career choice. But once I crossed that line, then especially when I got my K, I was just like Janine, very much into research. And then there was no, there was never any thought from me ever of going to private practice and leaving academia. Yeah, I, I think this is individual and I bet there are multiple reasons and we should study it. Um, um, I was lucky, as I said, my parents were there to help me. So, uh, and as my mother was very pushy, my mother got her PhD by going, working nights and going to day to graduate school. So you can imagine she wasn't gonna look kindly on any of her children quitting academics. Um, I would say, there are multiple reasons people leave academic medicine. Money seems to be the biggest issue that there is, used to be a very big differential working in academics versus private. And I would say that's also a sea change now. I graduated medical school with zero debt, zero. That's just not the case anymore. So I think, yeah, there are a lot of reasons people are leaving academics and money is one of them and a big, proportion, I think, of our younger women have faced debt. And I think we have to deal with that. I think it's a really big problem for academic medicine. All excellent points, thank you. Um, there was uh, a question also for Dr. Mathis, um, just a question about, um, any examples that you could share regarding, you know, the, the excellent collaborative work that MPOG does has made such an impact, um, but sometimes we run into barriers sharing data between institutions. Have you run into that? And have you, um, do you have any advice for overcoming those barriers? Yeah, um, I can answer that question uh, both from a technical perspective and also just a sociologic perspective, just to make it broader and more applicable to the, the full group here. But the technical perspective is just, um, I've just relied a lot on the infrastructure that, who I think is potentially one of the best mentors of all time, Dr. Sachin Ketterpal here at the University of Michigan has set up. He's just invested so much of his life into setting up an infrastructure that promotes, uh, you know, logistically data sharing, you know, it's, it's a whole bunch of, IRBs, data use agreements, BAAs that get maintained, and we have a strong administrative group at University of Michigan that's constantly maintaining this, um, that you, you, you need to first have in place before any data sharing can even happen from a just a kind of a medical legal perspective. But then from a kind of a sociologic perspective, he's also, and, and you know, he's, he's done his best to 
imbue this on his mentees, such as myself, Alice and Janda, and it was here too, and she, she probably feels the same way that, um, you know, you have to um, promote a, a way, you know, um, a, a culture of, of collaboration and, and inclusivity. And so, you know, any, any project that gets done with um, a shared database, there's, there's not any, um, you know, the, the, the database, the MPOG database is collectively, um, so, you know, um, it, it's, it's put into one site at, at you know, um, you know, the data is all put in one place, but it's not really owned by anyone, um, you know, and anybody that wants to do a research project has to get um, the review and approval through our committee, which is comprised by representatives from every MPOG site. So if you have an idea, you're presenting it to all MPOG sites who have equal say and equal voting opportunity to accept or reject your proposal. And so kind of having that, like that instilling that um, culture of collaboration and trust um, is, is really important um, in doing multi-center research and quality improvement. And so, I mean, I just, um, I just, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm very grateful to have mentors that inspire, um, you know, that, that create opportunities for your career um, just um, by virtue of, of, of research projects and grant applications. But I also am grateful for having mentors that inspire you to um, be a good role model. Um, and he's also given me opportunities, you know, when, when I had, uh, our, our, you know, I've had, a, I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old, but he was very um, um, lenient about uh, time off during the, the, those times. Um, but ha having just, you know, being a good character role model, I think is important in inspiring a culture of collaboration and trust is critical for effective data sharing across hospitals. Excellent. Well, we are sort of winding down on the on the hour that we had, or hour and a half we had allotted for this time. So I just wanted to say thank you so much to Dr. Todorovic, Dr. Mathis, and Dr. Wiener Kernish for sharing all of this insight. Um, and we really do hope that um, ESAS can be a place where we can come together and share these ideas, but also that we can network and help you help provide you with um, some of that mentorship and sponsorship, um, or even just advice on how to find that in your own institution, but just a place that you can be a sounding board and that we can all work together collaboratively um, to think about really expanding the ways that we do research, the areas that we're involved in, and um, in the ways that we get everyone involved in this, this excellent endeavor. So thank you all so much for taking the time um, out of your busy schedules to prepare those talks and to share that with us. And um, I believe we will take a brief break um, and then be back in about, um, 10 or 15 minutes for our next excellent panel. And uh, we encourage you, the link has been placed in the chat, um, but ESAS has a doc matters group that's just specifically for um, engaging in these types of questions. And so we encourage you to um, continue the discussion there and, and continue that using that as a networking opportunity. Um, and please continue to reach out with any further questions you may have. Kim, thank you. If I can just say, great honor, you met all of us, so please reach out. If Janine or I or Monica can help in any way, we've been there, done that, please don't, don't feel bashful. Get on the phone, send an email, contact us, because we are here really to give you all the information we can, regardless of what your institution is and what is going on at the moment. Uh, we've probably seen a lot of it, so uh, we can at least uh, be a, a good shoulder to cry on or somebody who can guide you through some of the points. So this is really a true purpose of the gathering like this. I agree. Thank you so much. Thank you.